Hi, everyone. So I'm Yuxin from Stanford. And thanks for inviting me to uh, this great workshop. And today I'm going to talk about face, uh, face retrieval uh, using a non-convex optimization um, paradigm. And this is joint work uh, with Professor Emmanuel Candice. Okay, so uh, as many of you already know, face retrieval is a problem that has like puzzled physicists for several decades. Uh, the, the basic issue is that so uh, in optical imaging systems, the optical sensors and detectors are usually unable to record or measure the intensity of the light. Uh, so sorry, they can only record the intensity of the light, but they are unable to see the faces. So for example, if I have for something that passing through an optical system, what we are going to be able to record is only the intensity measurements. So if we assume linear optics, for example, if we, uh, which is saying that we assume that uh, the light field at the receiver end is a linear transformation of the object of the interest at, uh, at the transmitter end, um, then what we are going to observe is just the square magnitude of some linear transformation of the object of interest. So basically we have quadratic uh, measurements and we are trying to recover everything from this uh, intensity only measurements. So this has its origin in many of the applications, for example, in X-ray uh, crystallography, uh, and also like astronomy and microscopy, a lot of other things. And due to the time constraint, I won't go into these things. So interest, for, for those of you who are interested in, in these applications, you can look at the survey by Yonina and uh, her co-authors. Okay, so today, let me just focus on the simple uh, mathematical model. So let's assume this is a discrete world. Uh, we have a finite dimensional signal X, which we are trying to infer. And we obtain uh, quadratic measurements about this X. So YK is our measurements. And we have in total number M of them. And AK here uh, denotes the sampling vector. So uh, this is known to us. And phase retrieval is essentially a feasibility problem. So we are trying to find the solution X that is compatible uh, with the quadratic measurements. Unfortunately, there is not a single method that allows us to solve quadratic system of equations in general. This actually is an mp hard problem. Fortunately, if we know that the, AK, uh, the, design, the sampling vectors are somehow like unstructured or incoherent or random or whatever you want to call. And there is actually hope that we can solve this problem perfectly. Okay, so to solve this problem, uh, suppose that we are given some yk, which is generated by this uh, quadratic transformation about that via some sort of like uh, likelihood function. A very natural uh, candidate is to find the maximum likelihood estimate. So L here uh, in this talk, I will use it to represent a negative log likelihood function, assuming that you know some of them. So for example, for the Gaussian case, you have some uh, polynomial function to minimize, uh, which is a degree four uh, optimization problem. For Poisson data, you have another thing that might involve some logarithmic function here. Okay, and here I plot the uh, function surfaces for uh, these two cases, actually the negative for the, uh, L for the, these two cases. And you can see that the problem for this uh, phase retrieval problem is that uh, the function that we are going to optimize over is uh, it's non convex So there are many, uh, there are possibly many local minima there. So if we, this, and this is actually the hardness of the problem because there are many, uh, local stationary point, and we are not necessarily guaranteed to converge to the global minimum if we just use some iterative method. Okay, so uh, there has been one very interesting uh, line of work that has approached this pr uh, non converse optimization problem using a converse perspective. Uh, so basically, uh, the basic idea is to introduce some uh, augmented matrix which is a, a capital X, to represent this quadratic uh, form, which is X, X times X transpose. So basically I'm trying to lift this uh, 
uh, rank one uh, matrix to a full matrix. And then, uh, so we, with the introduction of this capital X, we are able to linearize the quadratic constraints because the quadratic constraints, the, 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 hard, the hard part that uh, give us the non-convex part. So with the introduction of these new variables, we are able to convert our um, many of the log likelihood functions into uh, two convex problems. For example, for both Gaussian and for Poisson case, we can write them in, in the con uh, convex form. And it has been shown uh, by s several different groups of people uh, that uh, using this convex relaxation, we are actually able to achieve a very good uh, theoretical guarantee in terms of both sample complexity in terms of the uh, stability to noise and a lot of things. But uh, the issue is that uh, uh, for many of, the, if you just pass them into some standard um, convex solvers and the computation is very expensive because you are now working with a much higher dimensional world. But as as uh, you have seen in the last talk, there, there seems to be other methods that can deal with it. Uh, but um, maybe if we just look at the, those standard methods, then this seems to be computationally uh, too expensive if we want to work with uh, real images. Okay, so this talk, uh, I'll just focus on uh, non convex optimization paradigm. So the basic idea is that uh, it, since matrix lifting is very expensive, then why don't we just work with the vector domain? So instead of doing anything of, about the matrix lifting, why not just working with the vector domain and optimize the non-convex functional directly? And since this is a non-convex uh, non surface, so they are, you can think of them as many valleys, and there's only one valley that will give you the global optimal. So we need to start uh, at some uh, point that is sufficiently close to the global optimal. And if we have obtained such an appropriate initial guess, then we can proceed using some iterative method, like gradient descent, like alternating minimization, message passing, a lot of them. And they, they sh uh, if we, the uh, iterations are designed in a careful, careful manner, then we are able to avoid uh, the many of the local minima, so which will eventually allows us to reach uh, the ground truth. Okay, so in this talk, I will focus on one particular paradigm, which is Wertinger flow. And this has been designed uh, last year by Emmanuel Candace and Xiaodong and Maddie. So let me uh, summarize what they have been doing. Okay, so this is a two-stage algorithm. So first, we initialize, we find an initial guess using uh, spectral methods. So we try to find the leading eigenvector of this matrix, and then with suitable uh, normalization. And after we get this uh, suit, uh, uh, initial guess, we try to follow some sort of like Wertinger flow. Basically, the NAPLA uh, L here uh, represents the Wertinger gradient uh, with, res uh, uh, with respect to Z for this function. And for those of you who doesn't know what this uh, Wertinger gradient is basically this. You can just think of it as a generalization of the gradient. So in the real world, in the real case, uh, this is basically just exactly equal to the gradient. Okay. So there has already been a lot of theory developed for this algorithm. So uh, so let me summarize the most interesting part. So suppose that we uh, the data is noiseless. And suppose that we have IID Gaussian design, so the sampling vectors are generated as IID Gaussian. And if we, the number of samples we get, the number of samples m is larger than n times log n. And if we choose the step size to be small enough, so which is one over n, roughly on the order of one over n. And the accuracy, so the, the error shrinks uh, geometrically to the, and, and it converges geometrically fast to the ground truth. But uh, let's look at, examine it a little bit more carefully. So now l l I recall that. I assume that the step size is chosen to be one over n. 
So the convergence rate is basically just one minus one over n, roughly. So basically it says that within n times some logarithmic uh, iterations, it can converge to uh, the ground truth. So after a little bit more thought, you can see that actually the total computational cost, if we want to get an epsilon accuracy, it's going to be uh, roughly m times n squared times some log factor. And the sample complexity of this algorithm, as I said, is roughly n times log n. So this is already great, but uh, the question is uh, whether we can still improve it, because you can see that whether in terms of computational cost or in terms of sample complexity, none of them are actually optimal, because this uh, total computational cost is actually uh, n, roughly n times uh, the time taken to just read the data. And the sample complexity, if you remember, the, for the convex relaxation, it is sample complexity is n, it's not n log n. So it is missing a log n factor. So in this talk, I'm trying to develop some, a variant of the Wettinger flow type of algorithm and trying to achieve optimal computational cost and optimal sample complexity. Okay, and the algorithm is uh, what I'm going to call it truncated Wettinger flow for some simple reason. So again, the algorithm consists of two stages. The first is that you want to get a, a suitable initialization and this initialization, again, we try to find a leading eigenvector of a matrix, but this matrix looks very similar to the matrix for the Wettinger flow, except that we only use a subset of the data. We don't use all the data, we use a subset of the data. And the second step, we use some, again, we use some similar type of uh, gradient descent type of algorithm. But when we are forming the search direction, we, are, we try to be more data dependent. So we don't, again, when forming this search direction, we don't use all the data. We use a subset of the data. And which I will explain in detail a bit later. Uh, but before that, let me try to say a little bit about uh, what's happening if we don't truncate. So let's say we keep all the data, just uh, use, uh, do the, whatever the Wettinger flow algorithm is doing. So, okay, so with this Poisson likelihood, the search direction, okay, I do the calculation for you. This uh, Wettinger derivative will take this form. Okay, so for some illustration purpose, let's consider the case where x is just two dimensional. x and z are both two dimensional. And let me try to plot this, this gradient component for all ak that are univectors. So this will give, you, give us a locus that looks like this. So you can see that for most of the gradient components, so AK, which for the blue parts, they are actually pretty good. They are sort of like just pointing uh, to the direction that is just like opposite to X, which is good. But there are some parts of the gradient components, which means the red part, which can be arbitrarily bad. The reason is very simple because if you look at this gradient component, the denominator is actually, could be very small, some of them, maybe just one or two of them, but they, they could be very, very bad, very small. So uh, the contribution of these terms could be excessively large. So you get something like the red components which are pointing to nowhere. Okay, so uh, although most of them are good, maybe just including these bad components, that will, uh, will give you an uncontrollable search direction. Actually, this, these will result in very large variance. And they, uh, these search direction, it turns out that they often overshoot just due to these excessively large gradient components. Unless uh, Z is extremely close to X, then they, uh, the experiments show that actually they always overshoot. So if I just show you some numerical experiment, you can see that if I just run this Wettinger flow for a wide range of SNR, it will just give you uh, accuracy MS, M, uh, relative MSC that is about 30 dB, and so which is, it uh, doesn't converge to anything. Okay, so uh, in order to address this issue, the uh, strategy is very simple. So we know that this is 
not working just because of these red components. So why not just trim away these bad components, so stay with these good components, which are the blue parts. And detecting these uh, red components is fairly easy because we, the only thing that we need to do is just to examine the weight or the size of these gradient components. So basically, we look at each of the data, each of the gradient components, we check the size of that. So if the size of this gradient component is excessively large compared to its average, then we just truncate it. Otherwise, we use it. This might introduce a little bit of the bias, but it will dramatically uh, reduce the variance. So as a result, if you look at the numerical plot, actually, the, with this a little bit of truncation, actually, uh, the relative M MSC will drop from uh, 30 dB to minus 30 dB, actually. So which is saying that it is converges uh, very well. Okay, so uh, this, this is basically to show that why we need to truncate in order to ensure convergence. And we can further show, what we can further show is that, uh, okay, so this not only converge, this converges very fast. Okay, so first uh, let me show you some numerical experiment. So suppose, uh, in order to give you a better sense, uh, let me also try to do some experiment just for least square. So suppose I give you all the phase information. So I give away this phase retrieval problem and reduce this to the least square problem. And least square problem, we know that we can use a conjugate gradient, which is one of the most popular large scale uh, least square method to solve it. So uh, this is a plot showing the relative error uh, as a function of the iteration count. And so for the illustration purpose, I rescale the uh, x-axis so that one uh, TWF iterations is roughly equal to four uh, least square iterations. And then you can see that basically these two convergence curves is roughly like lying on top of each other. So this is somehow saying that for uh, this random unconstructed uh, well-conditioned design matrix, the computation cost of our algorithm is roughly just four times uh, the computational cost for solving a least square problem. So if you solve a least square using one CPU, I just use four CPU to solve it then in the, in the same, same time. Okay, and so if you are careful enough, you might say, okay, this is only plotting the relative error in terms of the iteration count. But within each iteration, and I can also show you the computational cost for each iteration. For the initialization, we are trying to do the leading, find the leading eigenvector of that. But if we just use power method and each iteration, uh, we can just use 20 iterations of power method. Each, each iteration involves uh, one application of A and one application of A, A transpose. For computing the uh, truncated gradient, again, uh, a little al just a little bit of algebra can show that this can also be rewritten as this form, which involves one application of this A uh, a matrix vector multiplication and another application of A transpose. Basically, just for each, each iteration, you need two uh, matrix vector multiplication, which is exactly the same as the cost for uh, conjugates gradient. So, they, so in, just in summary, uh, in total we need just a couple hundred of applications of A or A transpose and we don't need to do any matrix inversion or those type of things. Okay, so all these numerical findings can be formalized uh, by our theory. So, in, so what we are able to prove is the following. So suppose that uh, we have noiseless data, we have ID Gaussian design, and suppose that the sample size is uh, proportional to the number of unknowns, and we pick the step size to be something a con like a constant. In fact, in all the experiments I show you, I pick this to be 0.2, the step size to be 0.2. Then, in this case, the relative error shrinks uh, geometrically fast to, uh, to zero. 
where rho here is some constant boundary away from zero and one. Okay, so we have, uh, uh, so we, we can converge in logarithmic iterations. So this uh, theorem is basically telling you two, two things. First, this is a linear time algorithm. So the total computational cost for epsilon accuracy is m times n times uh, some log factor. So this is actually proportional to the time that it takes to just read all the data. And the sample complexity is uh, proportional to uh, the number of unknowns. And numerically, typically the sample complexity, if we, this, is, this is plotting the empirical success rate as a function of the number of measurements. And typically we only need about 4.5 uh, so we only need a number of samples to be about 4.5 times the number of unknowns in order to ensure uh, exact recovery in, in all the uh, Monte Carlo trials. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, let me try to provide a little bit of the interpretation uh, about the, uh, the algorithm that we have. So for, uh, uh, let me start with the uh, initialization uh, stage. Okay, so this is the, Y is the matrix that we are going to use for the working flow, so without truncation. And let's see what's the issue with this thing. Okay, so we are hoping, uh, when in the working flow thing, we are hoping that because on average, this thing, uh, the, on the, the average of this matrix will goes to this guy. So which basically saying that the ground true X is somehow like the principal component of this uh, Y matrix. So we are hoping that if we try to find a leading eigenvector, then it converges to the right thing. But unfortunately, there is some issue with this. So if M, the number of samples is not that large, then if we, we can see that we can actually find many, many of the univectors if when they project to Y, so this guy will be much larger than x transpose times y times x. This is basically saying there are many of the directions that is closer to uh, the leading component of this y in comparison to the ground truth x. So uh, this happens basically because we have a lot of yk that is excessively large. Although they just be larger than the average by a log logarithmic factor, it is also something that will completely ruin your algorithm. So the solution is very simple because we know that this happens only because there are some YK that is very large, so why not just trim away these large YK and only use those YK that uh, take typical size? So we basically just do some selection use those typical size YK, form a matrix and take a leading vector, eigenvector and this already solves the problem. And this is not just a uh, theoretical issue, this is actually a very practical issue. So I'm plotting the MSE, empirical MSE for these two methods. You can see that as the number of unknowns grows, the spectral method without truncation we're getting worse and worse because it gets a larger and larger MSC. And for a better illustration purpose, let's just look at some real image. So this is an original image, the ground true image. So if we just do spectral initialization without truncation, and this is the image, initial guess that will, the algorithm will give you, which actually you, I don't think you can see anything from this uh, image. But if you just use a little bit of the truncation, you can see that well, and okay, so I guess some rough estimate, but which already shows you many of the details of the image. And after this truncated spectral initial, initialization, I just run it for 50 iterations, and then I, get, I, I, I obtain almost perfect uh, recovery. Okay, so how much time, how much time I have? So, uh, the, so, uh, let me, uh, so let me skip this because I probably don't have time. So, so far I have focused on the noiseless data. And interestingly, this algorithm extends to uh, noisy data. 
and with optimal uh, stability guarantees. So let's consider this model, okay? So now I have noise, so let's model it as an additive noise. And the signal to noise ratio, well, for, for this model, you can just write it in this way, okay? So then it turns out that, again, under the Gaussian design, if the sample size is proportional to the number of unknowns, if the step size is chosen to be like 0.2 or something, with high probability after t iterations, the relative error will sh shrink geometrically fast to the order of one over square root of SNR. Okay, so note that this is uh, roughly the, like the L2 distance modulo some global phase. So if you consider MSC, and then this will just shrink to one over SNR. And this can be corroborated by numerical data because if we just run this algorithm, you can see if I plot this relative MSE in terms of SNR, if you plot both of them in term, in the, on the dB scale, then you can see that this slope is roughly minus one, which exactly matches the theory that we have. And the interesting thing is that this uh, statistical accuracy is actually near optimal. So why? So again, let me sh just show you some numerical things. So let's compare with something that we can compute and that we know is definitely better than this. Okay, so let's kind of do some MLE, but let me try to re review the phase information to you. I give you a lot of the information about the phase. So I change this quadratic problem into a linear system problem, but with Poisson data. Okay, so and with just this precious side information, then we can convert uh, MLE into a convex program which we can solve by CVX. Then just by using CVX to solve it, you can see that, well, with the phase information, I get this curve. Without phase, I get this blue curve. So there is only like a 1.5 dB loss if we don't have any of the uh, phase information and this, is, this can be uh, formalized uh, uh, in a rigorous way because if suppose that we have Poisson data and suppose we have SNR. So again, using the, exactly the same setting and for any method, the minimax risk uh, must be larger than one over square root of SNR, which is saying that the, uh, the, 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 the statistical accuracy of the algorithm that we have developed it's essentially otherwise optimal. Okay, so uh, just to conclude, we have developed an algorithm that uh, have matching uh, theoretical guarantees to the way using convex relaxation, but it is much faster and typically only takes like four, uh, the computational cost is typically just four times the cost it takes to solve a li uh, linear system problem and all the paper, data, and code are all available online, and thank you for your attention. Any questions? So, uh, in relation to the title of the talk, mm -hmm. um, if I give you a random, syst a random quadratic system, yeah. uh, can you apply this to solve it? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Um, yeah, we can definitely, I mean, so what type of random quadratic system you are? So here, okay, so there so are- So I generate a, a random uh, square matrix, X, or let's say A. Yeah. And I tell you to solve X transpose AX. Yeah. And you, you, you can do it? Yes, 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 we can do it. As long as this is random enough, I mean. <laughs> And this is hard to define. So here we can say that for Gaussian, for ID sub Gaussian, or for like uh, coded diffraction pattern, those type of things. So which is basically a Fourier matrix randomized a little bit. And all these like some sort of like incoherent randomized system should be working all good. But for other type of measurement, it's, it's very coherent to the standard basis, then it's not, it's not going to work. So somehow, like the sampling vectors, you need to have each elements cannot be too large. There shouldn't be any of the elements that is dominating. So most of them should be roughly of the same 
weight, and that is the hope. Otherwise, maybe there's no method that can guarantee. Maybe even uniqueness is not guaranteed. 